Thanks for having me, Mark. Um, I thought I would open uh, with a poem, one of my favorites, um, that kind of speaks to writing itself um, as well as place-based poetry, which tends to be what I end up producing more often than not. A sense of place is always important to me. So um, I think everybody probably knows Seamus Heaney, and this is his famous poem, Digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound. When the spade sinks into gravelly ground, my father digging. I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up 20 years away, stooping in rhythm through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness into our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade, just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's Bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly, heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge through living roots awaken in my head. But I've no spade to follow men like them, between my finger and my thumb. The squat pen rests. I'll dig with it. All right. Thank you very much. You just heard uh, Jessica Jones read Seamus Heaney's famous poem, Digging. Welcome to another Poets in Montana. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Jessica, all the way from Ohio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the uh, and, and thanks for reading that poem. I hadn't even thought about that. You mentioned hearing Lowell uh, read a couple of poems to kick it off. And uh, I love that poem, that, that Heaney poem. It's, uh, and it does, it does capture all that, but it, just the detail in the poem, all that leveraging, you know, the, against the inside of the knee and, and yeah. uh, all the great detail in the poem. It's a, it's, yeah. it's a work poem. It is. And it's a people's yeah. poem. It's, yeah. It's short, simple words that anybody can read and understand. Right. And it has all these layers to it for those that want more. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, so how are you? I'm good. I'm you're, glad to you're teaching. Yes, yes. I teach full time at Kent State University at Stark in Ohio during the winters. And then in the summers, I teach uh, with Upward Bound at University of Montana, serving kids from the Blackfeet Res and kids from Missoula. Um, and I used to live in Montana. So. Right, for years. Yeah. Uh, so uh, your first collection uh, of book yeah. is from Finishing Line Press, Bitterroot, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, do you want to uh, do you want to read something from Bitterroot to kind of yeah. kick us yeah. off? I thought I'd start out there. And um, part of the reason that I chose Seamus Heaney's piece to start out with is um, because I think that for a lot of writers, writing is about digging through the layers of our own lives. And I know in an email with you the other day, we kind of just briefly touched on this idea that like, wow, so often when we look back at our own work or if we read a book by someone else, it takes us back through those chapters of our own lives. Mm -hmm. You know, and the farther we go, the more chapters we have and so forth. Um, right. And in my own work, I find that whether I'm conscious of it or not, I'm often digging down to try to find, you know, where, where am I from? Where has my life taken me? What's my ancestry? What meaning am I making from all of this and so forth? Um, so I thought I'd start with a, a piece about that. Um, I think I'll read it first and then I'll unpack it a little bit. Uh, so this is kind of towards the end of the book, actually, and it's called Compass. <clears throat> My father reads to me from a box of letters over the phone. 
In 1873, Elvira Wright McQuirk traveled by wagon train from Ohio to the Bitterroot territory of Montana. We are incredulous and eager. This unknown envelope of family history, the same path I chose so randomly a century past her death. Other names trickle down, Cora Henrietta with a child's grave in Missoula, Horace and Henry at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. For weeks, my brain is alive with the cream walls of Ohio farm kitchens, the churn of wooden wheels, the butterscotch scent of ponderosa pines. Did she live beside the Salish as I do now? Was the bitter root for her too strange and familiar? Is this why upon arriving, I drove instinctively south to Stevensville, then north to the Jocko, to dream blindly behind red eyelids at Arlie? As if casting search lines across the continent, she pressed onward. Um, and it ends kind of ambiguously like that because I think that's how uh, figuring out our ancestry can be. Did you, did you, uh, were you aware of that before you came out to Montana? No. So that's an interesting part of the story. Um, I ended up at University of Montana for um, my master's degree because throughout my life at various points, I had done a lot of work um, with kids on Indian reservations, South Dakota and elsewhere. And I knew I wanted, I was a teacher and I knew I wanted to further my work in Native education. So I picked University of Montana, kind of fell in love stayed there, lived there, worked on the Flathead Reservation. And I'd been there several years when my dad kind of called me up and said, little did we know <laughs> oh. that, that a branch of our family traveled from Ohio, the little town where I'd been teaching there, right. all the way to Stevensville, which happened to be the, when I moved to Montana, I was on my own. I had kind of a few weeks before school started. And the first place I picked to go was Stevensville because I thought, well, it's close. You know, I can take a little day trip and get to know things and take a hike and so forth. And I had no idea that I had relatives there, nor that they had intermarried with the tribe that I ended up working with very closely later. Um, right. was all these kind of bizarre overlapping connections um, right. that are still there. But so, but but you you I mean, you were conscious of the fact that I mean that was kind of like the first sort of white settlement in Montana amidst all of the native peoples who were here, right? And, yes. And, and then when I when I got there, I learned that, but I didn't know that prior to just picking. Well, it you up. didn't know yeah. you didn't know anything about the Salish or about the about the Salish. I, I knew about the Salish, but I didn't I didn't know about Stevensville per se. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. And then the second place that I chose to go on, on during that first couple of weeks before school started was the Arley powwow. And there was something that just felt really comfortable to me there. I felt very at home. It was very welcomed, felt kind of oddly familiar. And I remember at the time I kind of wrote in my journal, like, wow, I don't, you know, this is a really bizarre experience. I just feel really at home here, you know? And then I ended up, you know, getting hired at Ronan, working with the kids there, found out that I had Salish relatives through via marriage in my family tree and just sort of sort of uncanny yeah well I mean that that that's another thing about life I mean you talk about yeah lifetimes that we've lived in the past and moved on from and incorporated another one and moved on from if you're lucky enough to live for a while yeah. but but there's also those uncanny winkies those connections that uh, it's like what the you know it's like, woo <laughs> what's going on right yeah it is yeah, i've had you know lots of those in my life and it's like well you know i guess it could just purely be coincidence but man that's a that's an interesting situation i'm dingers i know i yeah. agree completely yeah yeah yeah, totally. yeah. Well, that's very cool you uh I, and i also noticed in your bio that uh you know, besides uh, besides an, an active interest in indigenous people in this country, you've also been a worldwide traveler, yeah. and, and you spent some time in India. What what were you doing in India? I did. Um, I I've almost always in my teaching and in my um, writing and service work kind of ended up with marginalized populations. Um, so in um, Calcutta, I was on a team. Um, I'm not a nurse, but I was with a nursing team. I was kind of the visiting writer. Mm -hmm. And we traveled into the, the villages outside of Calcutta um, to serve the people there, as well as into the red light district. And we worked with um, rescued prostitutes and their children. 
Um, right. In fact, I'm I'm writing a, a manuscript right now that has to do with that experience as well as other travels. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully in the next year or so, I'll have something to start shipping out, you know, how that goes. Right. Right. But, yeah. yeah. I thought about reading something from that today, but I didn't, I didn't happen to pick that. So maybe you're, another. Uh, you're, you're, you're on, you're continuing to write. I mean, you're compulsively writing poetry also, I'm guessing. Trying to, you know, as, as a professor, it is hard to find the time. I really find that academia does take over for that, you know, totally. chunk of time during the school year. Yeah, no so. kidding. I mean, you just, yeah. to be a good teacher, you really do have to dedicate your life to being a really good teacher. Yeah. And that doesn't leave you a lot of time for, and, and I, I always noticed that, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why uh, I was on the Flathead Reservation teaching when, when I decided to stop teaching formal education, like uh, secondary education, just because it was, it had drained my well, yeah. and, and my well was in need of being replenished big time, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and so I just, I just had to stop. Yeah, uh, I but, understand. Yeah, yeah, no, I, it's, uh, I, and you, if I remember finding myself always in the summer, it's just, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the free time, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, go ahead, what's next? Well, you know, you said something, and I didn't have this on my radar, but I'm actually going to um, share this, because you, you asked me about the travel stuff, I'm, and, and teaching, so I'm teaching a travel writing class at Kent um, this coming semester, and I'm super excited about it, it's one of those you know, the, the dean's office dangles a carrot and says, you, you pick something fun you'd like to teach. And I threw this idea up in the air and they caught it and said, yes. And so, you know, I spent the last six months developing this course and then went my Christmas break and I'm wondering, was it really worth the carrot? But um, I'm here and uh, there's this wonderful quote in one of my favorite books. It's called Nothing to Declare, Mary Morris. She travels to um, Mexico in the 70s before Oaxaca was truly an expat community. It was kind of expat, but anyways, um, she's a solo female traveler, which I really, that resonates with me because it's not an easy thing to do. And that's usually how I've traveled. Um, and she has this quote um, that says, how do you know if you are a traveler? What are the telltale signs? As with most compulsions, such as being a gambler, a gambler or a kleptomaniac or a writer, the obvious proof is that you can't stop. If you are hooked, you're hooked. One sure sign of travelers is their relationship to maps. I cannot say how much of my life I have spent looking at maps, but there is no map I won't stare at and study. I love to measure each detail with my thumb to see how far I've come, how far I've yet to go. I love maps the way stamp collectors love stamps, not for their usefulness, but rather for the sheer beauty of the object itself. I love to look at a map, even if it's a map of Mars, and figure out where I'm going and how I'm going to get there, what route I'll take, and so forth. And she kind of goes on. Um, but I, I I just get so jazzed by that quote, because that's me, you know, like my whole life, anytime there's a map, I'm studying it. And right. The next adventure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. A good yeah. friend of mine, a fellow writer and good friend of mine, he's just he he's always referred to himself as a gypsy. Mm -hmm. He's just always got to go and see what's on the other side of that ridge. He's always got to go and get yeah. to somewhere else. And and he always wants to move. He finally settled down for quite a few years in Alaska. Uh, but, uh, I mean, he had plenty of places to go while he was up there. I was going to say that's still an adventure. It's, yeah, you know, totally. Daily yeah. life is totally an adventure. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and that I think that's how I feel any time that I'm living in Montana, same way. I feel like every day can be kind of an adventure, um, which brings me to the next poem I had on the list. Um, there's a lot of driving in Montana, as we know. So a lot of my poems take place on the road. Um, it's winter, and I thought I'd read one that uh, talks a little bit about winter in Montana. This is called Whiteout. And I it also harkens to my love of maps and places and place names, because I think when you fall in love with a place, you start to know all the fine details about it. You know, every time I drive 93 North or South, I, it's almost like I have the road names memorized. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are the last names of my students, you know? So I, I see the, the the names and I know that's such and such a family or this, this is where such and such happened and so forth. Um, so this is Whiteout. Ravali Hill is a bitch in the snow. I've got studded tires and a sturdy little Toyota. 
and still I'm creeping 10 miles an hour down that curve past the bison range. Near the exit for 200, I see a few tiny flares, hot pink through the squall, and two road men trudging between mountain and a car that's on its back, empty like a burnt tobacco can. It'll be another hour to Missoula at this rate, and I still see idiots trying to pass, fishtailing into the snowy berm. Falling in love, it occurs to me, is like driving in the snow. Even with good tires and decent skills, there's no guarantee against bad breaks and blind spots. True that. <laughs> no guarantees. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's that. I, I remember just reading that uh, recently when I was rereading your book again and uh, reminded of another story that. Uh, and I don't know if it was in literature, if it was one that someone was telling me. Uh, you might even recognize it if it's in literature, but it was of a, of a wreck in uh, in Ravalli, and uh, which is not Ravalli. Well, it doesn't matter to <laughs> viewers out there. But you know, we're talking we're, we're two hundred comes yeah. in ninety three in Ravalli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And and uh, and someone was uh, uh, there was an accident. Someone was hit, I think, or dead on yeah. the road there and traffic was being diverted and everybody was driving by and looking at the person you know and it's like wake up calls for yeah. you know if you're a kid I remember driving you know places uh, as a kid all the time when I was younger everything was two lane highways so if anything happened you always were in a situation like that and you're kind of forced to yeah witness it, it's true I know Robert Lee and I have both written poems about that on um the way out to Ovando, right on the way out to the one room school house. And, and you know so much of your work or so much of the work in in Bitterroot is just that of of witnessing it seems like you yes. know yes yeah and actually that's something else I wanted to talk about and that leads into the next poem um because um I th I think part of the work of being a teacher and being a writer is and it, it and it can be really a fine line but bearing witness to the things we see around us, the good, the bad, the unjust, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, the poet Carolyn Forche talks about that quite a bit. Um, she has that book, um, shoot, what is the name of it? I have it on my shelf over there. A book of essays or? Um, it's, well, one of them is Against Forgetting. Um, I forget what the other one is, but anyways, she witnessed a lot of injustice when she was a peace worker in Colombia. Right. Um, I think it was Columbia, one of the, somewhere down there. Um, and then she went on to write about it and kind of got a lot of flack for writing about it and taking the risk of othering people who were already suffering and so forth. And she was kind of like, hey, look, they're not in a position of power to write about it themselves right now. Somebody's got to bear witness, yeah. you know, um, and it's tricky. I think it's really tricky. Um, but I, I'd like to read a poem that's in that vein right now. Um, and I, I think out of context, this could be a really dangerous poem because it could come off as a stereotype or um, flattening down um, a, a culture into one sort of image. So I'd like to assert that um, this is a book about one child in one instance in one classroom. Mm. It does speak to the fallout and the aftermath of colonialization. Um, the aftermath of the boarding school era. Um, and I think it does contain some stereotypes that exist because children who fall through the cracks historically in America as a result of some of these horrendous things the US government has done end up in the same situations as other children mm -hmm. because they have the same lack of resources and so forth. That's not to say that a, a, a child or an individual or a culture can't rise above that into what um all the time. To is, yeah right yeah survive and celebration despite it all and so forth um but um this is a, a poem set in uh the school where I taught on the flathead um and there's a book in here that some listeners may or may not be familiar with called Island of the Blue Dolphins um so after the end of the poem I'll read a little footnote about that book yeah. This is called New Girl, and this first appeared in uh, Brightbone. So shout out to Natalie Petersey, who has this wonderful press, Open Country, over in Helena. Uh, new Girl. The secretary brings a new girl to my door during class, Asda from New Mexico, with round cheeks and brown skin. She buries her face in her mother's breast, 
Miss Azee measures me with one glass eye, stroking her daughter's hair. Asda blurts out in class and steals like a three-year-old. During one lunch detention, tells me how her parents leave for weeks at a time, even when it's cold, just her and the dog. Early November, she's absent three days, then shows up at lunch and whispers, I have lice. In December, her folks get a stove for their trailer. She misses school to get wood, but bounces in her boots in homeroom. It's warm. One grammar lesson, I catch her with an illustrated book of Navajo poems, entirely focused. During spelling, she begs for colored pencils, draws Karana from Island of the Blue Dolphins in full regalia beside her dog, abandoned by the Aleuts. And the footnote is really important. Um, Island of the Blue Dolphins is a, a young adult novel loosely and controversially based on the true story of an indigenous woman who was abandoned on S San Nicolas Island as a result of colon colonialism. Um, she was left to survive with only her dog as a companion, and she's rescued 18 years later by missionaries, only to learn that her tribe perished um, as a result of forced migration, and no one is left to speak her language. Um, and it, it really touched me that this little girl, who obviously was facing a lot of struggles, just zoned in on that story. She absolutely loved that story. She, she didn't want to pay attention to much else in class, but Karana was like a character she could relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't even, uh, cross my mind that, that that would be any kind of an issue reading that poem. I understand exactly what you were getting at earlier with that whole prelude, yeah. uh, you know, and particularly I understand it, uh, doubly, I think because I'm old and I'm a white man, at this point, and I understand that a lot of people don't want to hear what the I have to say, which is fine, because I mean, I understand the situation and I'm willing to stand off to the side and shut up. But if they want to know what I have to say, I'll tell them what I have to say. And nobody can tell me that what I have to say is shouldn't be said or what I have to write shouldn't be written. I'm just not into cancel culture. I don't give a shit what's happened. I know what's happened before me. I've witnessed a lot of things. We've come a long way, you know? I mean, Martin Luther King's birthday is Monday. Yeah. Not his, it is, is it, I don't know if it's his birthday. It's a, it's a celebration. I meant the 17th might be his birthday. But anyway, that whole 60 years ago, yeah. 60 years ago, he gave that speech, I have yeah. a dream. Uh, in Washington, and uh, that kind of stuff has relevance to me and everybody that lived through it in a different way than it right. does to people right now, especially young kids. And so for us to witness however we experience that, I think is very important. Everybody should listen to everybody else and, uh, and right. express their point of view. Yes, I think that it I think that's one of the things that literature does for us. It allows us to braid together all of those threads, you know? Right. And, 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 and another reason why I think it's so important not to cancel it. Mm -hmm. it was written, when it was written, you can't change it because it did and acted and mm -hmm. portrayed the way humanity was at that time in the world, right? Those things are reminders to us of exactly of what we, it, th those things do exactly the opposite of what a lot of people say they are not doing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like they show you what you need to see. This is why you need to pay attention. <laughs> right. Not right. forget the past. This is why we read history, right? That's yeah. actually that's perfect. So my next one was gonna be marginalia. Okay. I, I I know I've read this during other readings before. Um but I, I still feel like it's really relevant and important and it, it kind of speaks to everything that we're talking about. Um, so I'm sure you know what marginally is, but other folks might not. In the edges of books where um, previous readers leave little marks and so forth, that's called marginalia. Some people hate it. My boyfriend really hates marginalia. It annoys him. I love it. If I find a book in the thrift store, I'm like, ooh, yay, what did somebody else have to say about this uh, this book, you know? Uh, but this is called marginalia, using that as kind of a metaphor. 
1995, Billings, Montana responded to a series of hate crimes by printing menorahs in the local paper for everyone to hang. Sending paint crews to native, black, and Jewish homes ruined by swastikas, campaigning the message, not in our town. 20 years later, teachers make white cranes of KKK Bibles, transposed diagrams of slaves packed into the belly of a ship, whisper, give them names, give them all names. Is it possible to bring back passenger pigeons from extinction? Indigenous children don't have truth and reconciliation unless they read between the lines. America is singing in its river's names the voices of disc jockeys who flip Navajo and English like coins on 960 AM, New Mexico. Ask, we urge from the chalkboard. Keep asking, whose voice is missing? Who flutters on the margin of the page in the schoolyard? The city limits, waiting to interject. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and it's even more pertinent and more uh, important uh, at this particular moment in time because obviously we are experiencing this swing in the pendulum uh, where a lot of history seems to have been forgotten, where a lot of people are trying to push back the other direction to start silencing people. What the fuck is that all about? That's exactly the wrong direction to go, right? I mean, we're all on this movement of yeah. pulling people onto the page, right? Right, right. Yeah, right. exactly. And 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 now you've got these people saying, no, these people can't be on the page. Or they aren't people or or whatever. I, I don't know. You know, so anyway. I wish so much that we could we could have kind of a peace and reconciliation type of thing in America, the way that we saw during post-apartheid in South Africa, when when everybody was kind of brought to the stage and and had to open up and tell their stories. Because storytelling is healing. Oh, totally. Yeah, it's exactly. Powerful. When you get to unburden. There was an article in the Missoulian uh, here just this last week about this you know, the, this goofy idea of sausage making that the our legislators have decided to get together as just the, the people, you know, after work or whatever, and make sausage, which is kind of, you know, a goofy old, old Montana sort of thing to do. They used to make sausages in the garage, the old Germans next door to me when I was growing up. And uh, oh, everybody go over and but so so now so all these old you know Republicans and and these Democrats are all together making sausages and and they're forced to encounter each other as actual people. That's got to have a benefit on what the hell happens inside that chamber. Let's hope it does. I mean, if it doesn't, then we are doomed. Right. I I agree completely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So yeah. I could talk about this forever. Um, I think I'll hold off on that. that I, get side, I get sidetracked. We're here to read poetry, right? No, that's fine. You know, the next one I had, though, was political. So I think this is a good transition. This is not in Bitterroot. I'm kind of moving on from Bitterroot. Um, this is a piece I read at uh, the Jawbone Festival in Kent, uh, Kent State University last spring. Um, and I wrote it back in November 6th of 2016. So that's kind of going to tell you where this is going. Um, but it's about exactly what you were just saying. Yeah. After the election, I cross wet yellow leaves to my car, listen to news anchors stumble, drive to school not knowing who to trust or what to say to my students about our reading, Sherman Alexie's Dachau, from his view as a Spokane Indian. I want to write on the board, find your peace. Do not let fear grip you. The soul cannot be destroyed because it is eternal, but I was not hired to teach religion or politics. So I call roll, make a grammar joke, laughter breaking through like tentative ice picks. And they tilt their heads at the poem, say, I don't get it, where is he? Till we walk line by line through the darkness. They grow somber with the hard numbers of native and Jewish and Cambodian genocides of the lies folded into our textbooks, shelves of moccasins, piles of boots. I have nothing new to say about death, Sherman Alexie concludes and I press what my job will afford. Do not let yourselves be divided. 
whatever your party or creed. Listen, because wisdom arises from stillness. Remember the taste of fresh peppermint leaves. Behold a snail on his path. Know that I could have been born in your shoes or you in mine. Yeah, that's a, that's about as simple and basic as it gets. And I don't know, uh, I, I'm just mystified why a certain percentage of us don't seem to be on that page. I thought that was about as fundamental as it got, whether you were in a church or whether you were in a civics classroom <laughs> when I was growing up. So right. I feel really sort of uh, uh, disconnected, and I know a lot of us do. I just don't know how to connect uh, with a lot of people at this point. And but you know, I mean, I you know, I do agree that a whole a lot of the issue is probably this uh, uh, depersonalization, this this sort of uh, uh, media driven world where people are more and more isolated in this uh, virtual environment as opposed to uh, direct engagement. I mean, when you're standing face to face with somebody this close, e even this, because this is fairly personal, but you and I would treat each other somewhat differently if right. we were in person with each We'd other. We'd be holding a beer, Mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> You're goddamn right about that. Or a mug with a rainbow on it from Fact and Fiction or something. I mean, <laughs> it might have past blue ribbon in the mug. But <laughs> and yeah, so anyway, that's uh, yeah. Well, anyway, good, good, good poem. You know, I I think that um, part of the reason we've gotten where we've gotten as a society. Uh, you're talking to a teacher, so my answer is always going to be about education, I guess, but. I think part of it is this idea of like pushing for for STEM, you know, for just science and technology and math and leaving out the humanities because it's literature that teaches us empathy as small children. When we have to read books and we put ourselves in the shoes of a character, we learn a whole host of other experiences. But when we, you know, when we only exist cerebrally and then our social realms are echo chambers on Facebook or whatever, and we don't have the those third places anymore of, of being on a bowling alley team or showing up at the diner where we, you know, every Friday morning we have coffee with Joe next door. Right. We don't have as much of that in our society anymore. And, and we start to lose empathy because we're not put in situations where we have to have it. So literature is the answer. <laughs> I, I, I believe you're absolutely uh, onto it. And uh, you talked about uh, your dad reading you uh, letters from your, your great grandmother uh, from the late 1800s. I came into a box of letters that uh, was given to me by an old friend that were written in the 1920s. And uh, in, in, in Alberton, the little town I grew up in, and uh, they were so incredibly literate. Yeah, uh, they're very good letter writers uh, in in their descriptive writing and in their their voice, their their personal connection with the audience, the person they're writing to, and all of that, and their references sometimes to literature. I mean, these people read yeah. Twain. And, yeah. and they read, you know, Longfellow and Tennyson, and they read Dickens. I was just going to say Charles Dickens. They, they, I mean, they knew these, they knew these, these people, yeah. and those people uh, taught, taught us things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. Taught us things. And, and that's, I mean, that's where your the values of your culture come from, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the fact that the, the great books the holy books, they're the same thing, right? They're just older kind of stories, uh, which I think these other people probably improved upon. <laughs> but the values were still there, right? Yes. The values of, it's the golden rule. I say this over and over again, right? I mean, it's just, yeah, that's just that. Walk in somebody else's shoes. Do unto others what you'd have them do to you. Just be a decent goddamn human being. Right. Right. Stop and expose, other... yourself to, expose yourself to things besides your own experience. 
Yeah, and it comes down to, well, we said this a million times too. It comes down to fear and love, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hope or fear. Take and that pick. that actually also leads into the net. We're doing a good job of like. Oh, uh, right. It's like we orchestrated this damn thing. <laughs> and I swear to the audience, we did not. <laughs> oh, we did not, yeah. <laughs> Um, this one's also political. Um, there's a, a name of uh, a friend in this, my friend Greg Beeler. Um, I refer to him as Beeler in this. And um, the date of this one is also probably pretty telling. So it's February 27th, 2022. Mm -hmm. Beeler came Sunday night and we poured two shots of writer's tears, sat at the big desk and recounted scenes from the news. A 25-year-old teacher fleeing Kiev who'd never seen so many cats on the train. Everyone, it seemed, trying to get out of Ukraine with their cats. And the sunflower seeds, Beeler said, so that if a soldier fell, the national flower would bloom where he bled. One of those aching realizations that by next week will be old heavy news. And the Brits, young men with cockney accents, leaning high to the wall, chins barely touching at stones, suddenly small like boys in men's boots saying to the officer, yes, we'd like to sign up for the Ukraine military or whatever you call it. Euler and I are in a Sunday evening an ocean away. My kitten paws playfully at our pens, our throats warm with whiskey, our friendship ordinary, in that we'll meet at the same time, same place next month. We earn our paychecks playing with words, but tonight we sit silent, and I contemplate the strength and fragility of human life. Like an egg, able to handle so much pressure, yet susceptible to cracking at the slightest tap. I recall once 20 years ago drinking vachni konjak in a village in Slovakia at 5 a.m., a friend's mother pouring egg liqueur into tiny earthenware goblets the shell's silt finding our lips from the bottom of the jug, before we walk to the train, parted ways. Time now between us, but the miles brief, like the diminutive aperture of generations, the helplessness of temporary sovereignty on the eve of an unnecessary war. Nice. That's a good poem. Thanks. Yeah, and, uh, you know, your reference to being political and uh i because i i i want to say this every time i hear the word at this point and that is that everything is political yeah everything is political the politics of the family is one of the one of the most powerful and painful experiences that we experience that we have in life and uh, because it's just power it's talking about you know who's who's, who's struggling for power and uh, uh, people should never, the people should never lose in that process. That's what we seem to forget. You know, I mean, power is so addictive. It's right. so alluring to some people. It's, you know, just all there is. And I think mainly it's, it's a substitute for probably lack of love or, or for a counter to fear. I mean, anger is the first response to fear, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Fear is the root of all evil. And yeah. yeah. Um, I actually picked a poem to follow up that poem about the, the eve of the war um, with that in mind. And I wrote this poem long ago. I wrote this, oh my gosh, I don't even know how long ago. Um, and years later, I read a poem by Wendell Berry that reminded me of the poem that I wrote. And in his poem, it's on the eve of Vietnam and he's um, sowing uh, I think it's clover seeds maybe um, in the fields. And he's he, he's aware of what's going on. He's kind of, you know, watching the news at home and all he can do is go out and continue to sow his crops. I just love Wendell Berry. He's one of yep. my favorites. Um, yep. But I wrote this before I ever knew about Wendell Berry. So I wasn't copycatting. Um, this is called Walking Amish Country. When sky dips beneath that cusp of land on rising hill, a mirror sliced unexpectedly into sod. I stand, breathless from climbing, this side of a long, long view. My eyes search grass, snow, land, light, orange, pink, black. No sound but refrozen snow, scattered thoughts, stilled. Such a slender moon. 
such a slender moon. Nice. I, uh, I, and, and you, you planted the Wendell Berry seed just prior to reading that lovely little uh, poem. Uh, and I thought to myself, in regard to the Bitterroot, I, I managed to hear Wendell Berry read in that barn down on the Lee Metcalf Wildlife oh, Refuge. Cool. Yeah, I don't know how long ago now, what, 15 years ago, maybe something like that. Oh, they, that's amazing. They, they invited him out to uh to to read there and that was that was pretty cool he's he, an he and his wife yeah yeah i really like his work a lot i i only discovered him in the last decade you know it's funny kind of like we were talking about earlier with teachers we're so busy oftentimes we don't have time to pursue what we what we teach about if that makes sense you know like so sometimes I'll discover something just because I'm making a lesson plan and I'll be like, wow, I really like this writer. You know, I need to come back and read them. And then I'm like, how did I miss out on this guy? You know, I always try to be honest though. Like I've never read the Scarlet Letter. I don't know how that has happened. Someday I will, <laughs> you know. Well, there's, there's, there are so many people out there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and that's the thing. And, and you'll never, you'll never experience everybody. You'll never experience every, you know, great poem or story that's been written because there's too there's much. Yeah. But there's so much good stuff that's that's yeah. in print that uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be uh, dishing it out in big heaps all along the way and and uh, continuing to write more. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then time kind of sifts it out and decides what uh, floats what to the lasts. top. Over yeah, what lasts. Yeah, yeah, what lasts. Like the title of, isn't that the title of Jennifer Finley's one book, What Last? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I, you know, and I think about uh, that reference to, to Wendell Berry reading down the Bitterroot. I, obviously, I've heard a lot of uh, uh, wonderful writers and poets uh, come through the University of Montana and, and oh, to yeah. be able to hear and read there. But uh, I remember up on the reservation when I was up there living in Pablo and uh, uh, Corky Claremont oh, yeah. had gone back to DC and been at this arts thing back there. And it was something to do with the, na uh, uh, these, well, the National Book Award. Uh, but I don't know how, what, what Kirk Corky's relation was. There was an honoring thing going on. Well, he meets uh, the poet William Matthews. Do you know William oh, Matthews? I, I know his name, yeah. William, well, he's a, he's another one that you need to you need okay. to pick up and, and and read because William Matthews is a terrific poet, and uh, so anyway, he talked to William Matthews, who just got the National Book Award for this uh, poem collection of poetry that he did, and and Corky said, well, you should come out to Montana and visit, and Matthews said, I'd love to. We're going to do this tour. Can we come and can see you? Well, he came to SKC. That's awesome. And. Uh, and uh, Saley Scutney College, and read with uh, Vic Charlo, and uh, and me, and uh, uh, David Dale, and oh, I'm trying to think a couple other people. I don't think uh, I don't think Jennifer was was around at that time. You know, yeah. I, don't think, I think she was still out of state. Maybe she's probably but, still in New Mexico. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, so, cool. another side story. That's Sorry. Cool. Yeah, no, I I love all those stories. I met Corky. He he came to my classroom at one point, and I forget why. There were always you know things happening and running. In. Right. He, he's oh, he's no, done really he's done really great work with uh, yeah. with youth with yeah. uh, students and uh, he's and probably there for a youth outreach event. Yeah, he's a teaching artist for sure. Yeah, big time. yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, let's see. You know. Um, I think I'll actually, speaking of sort of wonderful um, poetry communities and the connections between people, there's a really wonderful community um, at Kent State with the Wick Poetry Center, which is nationally known. It's even internationally known in some pockets. Um, and there's kind of this broad reaching um, network, a lot of which is place-based. And one of their big projects last year was to um, do an inventory of species in the Cauga Valley National Park, Ooh. which is nearby. I live just on the edge of it. I can literally walk out my door to a trailhead that's three cool. minutes walk. 
and then it'll connect through the woods. Um, and I thought, I, since people out there in Montana probably aren't familiar with Midwest National Parks, hold up a few uh, images, and then I'm going to read a poem of mine um, that I wrote when I lived in the Kaga Valley. I got to be the um, poet in residence for a full year and work with little kids who came through the Environmental Center, kind of wow. third and fourth graders tromping through the woods and so forth. Um, and um, this project that Wick Poetry Center did recently, where they uh, uh, inventoried all of the species, um, was a lot of fun because it, they reached out to me among a lot of other people and said, hey, you know, pick a, a, a species off of this list. And because I'd lived there and become kind of intimately familiar with the plants in the woods and I was working with rangers and biologists and so forth, I had a poem already written. Um, so the, the species that I chose was wild carrot, which is also known as um, Queen Anne Fleece. And we, when Wick Poetry put this together, they hired uh, local illustrators to do these really lovely um, kind of versions of things. And it's all housed online and they have um, uh, archives, kind of like what you and I are doing where they interview people. Did I hold that upside down? Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> So I thought I'd read this one um, because it is place-based in a way, um, I guess, kind of flora and fauna and biology kind of way. Right. Uh, and then in the poem, there's a metaphor, of course, because it's poetry. What's the, what's the what's the pronunciation of the valley again, the, the park? Uh, Cuy Cuyahoga. It is Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a, that's a um, Seneca word um, mm -hmm. from this region kind of coming down. Yeah. Um, so this poem, Di Carota, is the uh, uh, Latin name of Queen Anne's Lace. Queen Anne's Lace, how many at five in the evening in August? Can't count those in arm's reach. White and cream, green and gold, mauve and white again. Snowflakes beaming face up, some curled, tentative, like girls at Quintanilla. Others spread like matrons' aprons, wise in the truth of their short hour dispensing perfect acceptance of time, instructing me against bitter patience to embrace their widening view, tactful, elegant, amid sifting light. Elegant, Queen Anne's lace. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Oh, gosh. We only have a few minutes left, so I'm trying to decide what to uh, finish with here. Oh, um, we must have 10 minutes left, don't we? I, I think so. Or something like that. Yeah, we got 10 probably. Okay. Um, I think I'll read another then from the um, Wick Poetry Center. Um, last year, they put out a wonderful collection of um, poems called Dear Vaccine. All right. A, a global collection. Um, and the idea was um, to invite people from all over, over the world to speak directly to the pandemic, as mm -hmm. well as to um, the vaccine itself. Um, it's edited edited by Naomi Shihab Nye, who of course is wonderful. She's the Youth Poet Laureate. Um, and then David Hassler, who's our fantastic poetry director at uh, WIC, um, and Tyler Meyer, um, who's out of state, but does all kinds of community outreach in the Southwest. Um, so this is my poem from uh, this collection. And it's really cool the way they published it. Um, the collection is housed online in archives and they just kind of use slashes to show where the line breaks are oh, sort yeah. of a real contemporary way of doing things I printed out my original because I I guess I rely on the choreography like a dancer would you know I need those you're, line you're breaks not, and, you're not a prose poet necessarily <laughs> right yeah not so much um but this is my piece dear vaccine <clears throat> dear vaccine Give back the wobbly table at the front of my physical classroom, where students and I broke bread, read a braided essay as snow fell out our window. Let elders more time to speak in Dine and Micmac and Haida, voices not muted by hospital glass, but heard laughing shoulder to shoulder. Grant us the perfume of a crowded opera, the useful liberty of shared work, the sacred plume of chalk dust, sawdust, pollen, dandelion butter on our naked noses. Allow us one more view from a 747, cheek pressed to glass to see the Rockies beneath a sherbet strata of pink. And my second hand quilted purse, 
I'd like to carry its bright paisley back out into the world, dive deep into its pockets for a shining dime when a stranger can't find their own. Let us, O oh vaccine, share life's brief and brimming cup, past hand to hand to hand. Nice. This is a really nice uh, collection to have around. Um, it's almost like a time capsule, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, it certainly will be uh, more so in time further yeah. down the road. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's just that whole thing was just so, so odd. Uh, and, and I guess that maybe it's always like that uh, in the history of things that uh, that maybe the full uh, awareness of the situation really won't come out for about a decade yeah. until it's behind us. And then, in, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, uh, some people really addressed it uh, well at the time. Uh, I mean, I read plenty of good things. Mm -hmm. the pandemic but I was I didn't even I, it was like something I didn't even want to try to do yeah. you know what I mean it was I, I felt I didn't know what to make of anything and of course I was still uh in a way reeling from the previous four or five years and, and the whole the whole phenomenon of of this of, of the Trump world thing and this this massive uh sort of uh right push uh that uh you know that, that involved racism and and all of the, the worst aspects of human nature I, I didn't know how to process that because my only reaction was anger mm -hmm. uh, it was just complete anger and uh uh you know it was like uh the way bullies affect me they just there's something that goes way back to childhood that triggers something in me and i just want to punch somebody right in the mouth instead of try to talk about it it's, a, it's an instant desire to overcome injustice yeah well and it's it's fear at its root you know i mean it's like this is this is a super reaction to that fear because i am afraid of that here you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah kind of, that it's just a it's a sort of an innate thing yeah yeah i, yeah. I don't want to get us back into that, that yeah but, uh, but it is uh, no, that's all right. Yeah, hard to write about things when you're in the in the thick of it. Sometimes I think it is. I think time does give us perspective. As I was kind of gathering things to read today, it was really fun, and I was also surprised by my own reactions to seeing my older writing. Maybe mm -hmm. because of what you're talking about, you know. Um, it's, it's like that saying, you can never step into the same river twice because the water is always moving and we're always changing, you know, and, and I think as write, writers may be more aware of that and artists and so forth, maybe um, than the rest of us, because we're forced to look at what we were thinking about at different points in our career, you know, it's, it, 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 to use the word time capsule again, it's kind of like that. And so as I was filtering through today, I found pieces that were kind of pre-pandemic or pre-Trump years or whatever. And it was like, wow, I was so naive and innocent and, and, you know, <laughs> did not know what was coming down the pipe. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I think a person who uh, is always spending way too much time in their head, uh, looking back, looking forward, scribbling things down, uh, uh, people that that aren't uh, that don't ever do that, they're just busy living their lives, probably. And and I'm suppose there are certain aspects uh, that that do come back and but not necessarily the the detail of whatever these other uh, yeah. people are doing. I, I, I would suspect that that's the way it works. Yeah. I make know. art as well. And I do that when I look back at, at my own artwork sometimes. And it's, you know, most writers look at things and most artists look at things and think, oh, why didn't I edit this a different way? Or, yeah. oh my gosh, I could have done so much better now or whatever. So there's also that element of it, just of the creative process too. Right. Yeah. When I worked at the writing center at University of Montana, we had this joke that we would always end up telling the students, you're not done yet. <laughs> you know, they'd bring their papers in and they'd think, okay, this is the final draft. I'm really done now. I'm going to turn this in and get an A++. And we're like, you're not done yet. And I think right. as writers, that's 
that's how that, it is. That should be like a course. It's like, uh, okay, here, here's the easiest course in graduate school. If you're going to teach people how to write, it's it's just one question. And then what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gary well, Lundy does that all the time. Anyway, yeah. go, what what uh, else have you got? Yeah. Um, I think, let's see. Well, there's two. I'll read one that's kind of a, it's, it's an older poem, but I've not published it anywhere yet. So I'm looking for a home for it. It's going to be part of my um, Ohio collection, I think. Um, and it's a winter poem, which I like because it's it's snowing outside right now. Um, and it's sort of surreal. There's a little element of uh, surrealness to this. This was also one of those pieces that I wrote pre-pandemic. Um, Might have been the beginning of the shift in American politics. Um, but it's one of those experiences kind of we talked about earlier about those uncanny experiences. And sometimes I won't, I'm not even aware that these are floating around in my conscious or my subconscious until I write a poem and then they turn up and I'm like, yeah, what was that about? You know? Um, right. so this is neither here nor there. It's just, it's a winter poem and it's, um, something kind of fun when, when I get a chance to read something new, I enjoy that. So parfaits. One snowy January weekend, as I recovered from yet another surgery, incisions making a map across my skin, footsteps appeared out of nowhere in Mama's long gravel driveway and walked towards the road. Twice in one day, no delivery, but I slept in the attic, weight of snow on the roof, blanketing me into dreams, cared for there by some wild woman with pelts and furs and good bone broth. When I awoke, Mama had filled the old parfait glasses downstairs, and so all weekend we delighted in layers of bright jello, lemon pudding, red cherry, January orange slices sunk to the bottom, and Cool Whip. Her husband, Jack, in Phoenix, she and I could take plenty of baths, to which Jack would have said, it smells like a French whorehouse in here. But snow and snow and more snow, so much that our Labrador, Stella, couldn't squat to pee, her hind legs buried in whiteness before the tall weeping pines along the property line. We watched deer. I stood by the patio door and remembered and remembered some more. And there were footprints starting with no entry point in the middle of the driveway all the way to the road. <laughs> yeah, that's got a real uh, mythical kind of a feel to it with the with the old woman and the skins and the and those footprints, yeah, nice. I like it. Yeah, great detail. Um, and then I thought to uh, to close, I would bring us back to Montana. Um, and this is a piece that was um, published in Poems Across the Big Sky several years back. Um, shout out to Lowell Yeager again. Um, and then another shout out to um, Literary Youngstown, who last spring chose this to um, turn into a postcard for uh, their Lit Youngstown series, uh, which is kind of fun. It's always neat when, you know, one organization or institution finds something and kind of rebirths it. Yeah. So I'll close with this. We've talked about a lot of um, controversial and heavy topics, but I, I like this piece because I think it's kind of a meditative reminder to step back into a wider lens. Mm -hmm. This is called, uh, what is it called? Route 90 West from Billings. Sky after sky, driving across Montana in October, a reminder that no thought, no matter how looming, how dramatic, clouds the mind forever. In some far northwest corner, turquoise beams through like the stones the woman at Sweetgrass Gifts laid out for me this morning. Bright spots among rough, sandy rock. Big timber. Exit 367. Driving, I snap frame after frame in my mind for canvases. Gold linseed dripping down slate blue. Angus black dots moving across brittle bleached grass. Alive, I sense their animal warmth. Shocking in a scene so otherwise immovable. Immutable? Im immovable. Immovable. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing is that, I mean, we are, uh, we are blessed uh, living in a place like Montana because 
you know, Mother Nature is always there to remind you that uh, you're just a tiny little speck in a blip in time of uh, eons of whatever. And uh, yeah. yeah, as much as I clamor to put words on paper and bind them in books, <laughs> they will eventually turn to dust. At some yeah. point. Just as like well this recording someday. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but damn it, we have to try. <laughs> <laughs> we have to try. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure, Jessica. And like, uh, and we didn't even get around to talking about how we even know each other through our mutual right. Robert Lee or yeah. or back uh, virtually that we right. made to visit you at Kent State where you teach in your wonderful creative writing class and all that. But uh, maybe next time. Yes. Wonderful connections. Yes. Yeah. Right. All right. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Oh, uh, thank you, Mark. And we'll chat again soon, I'm sure. Thank I'm you. sure. So uh, that was Jessica Jones. Join us uh, next time for another uh, episode of Poets in Montana. Later. Time filled